Yeah, we didn't even do an intro. <laughs> we'll have to do that at some point. And have a like Uncle John's band playing in the background or something. <laughs> Uncle John's band. Okay. Let me see if I can do that. Hold on. <laughs> or or like a skit of like Cheech and Chong. Dave's not here, man. <laughs> hold on. Hold on. Who is that? It's Dave. Open up, man. I got the stuff. Who is that? It's Dave, man. Open up. I got the stuff. Who? It's Dave, man. Open up. Who is it? It's Dave, man. Will you open up? I got the stuff with me. Who? Dave, man. Open up. Dave? Yeah, Dave. Come on, man. Open up. I think the cops saw me. Oh, Dave's not here. No, man. I'm Dave, man. Hey, who is it? Hey, come on, man. Who is it? It's Dave, man. Will you open up? I got the stuff with me. Who? Dave, man. Open up. Dave? Yeah, Dave. Dave's not here. What the hell? No, man. I'm Dave. Will you... Come on, open up. I got the stuff. <laughs> who is it? It's... <laughs> Dave's not here, man. <laughs> It's witchcraft. (laughs) Hi, and welcome to a special 420 episode of the Stoned Witches Hour. On this show, we tell stories designed to scare the crap out of each other while we smoke mass quantities of weed. On the West Coast, telling you stories of gruesome Stop. crimes and scary ghosts, I'm Layla. And I'm High. I mean, I'm Shell. <laughs> <laughs> Happy 420. Happy 420. <laughs> How awesome is this? You know, it's getting more and more legal everywhere, and I cannot be happier. I love seeing legalization roll out. It's We've passed the tipping point, I think. We have definitely, the snowball is rolling. They can't stop us now. Spring has sprung and legalization has sprung. It's sprouting up all across the country. It really is. You know, go, go Senate. (laughs) You know, if you're at least going to take all of our tax dollars, we at least let us buy what we want with it. I mean, come on, go ahead, tax it, fine, whatever. Just make sure there's provisions for home grows because come on, it's a freaking weed. Don't, don't legislate it out of home grows. I want to do this thing and I'm thinking... Who would hop on a plane and go to Romania with me? Layla, duh. Tomorrow, when? Right? And you don't even know what the thing is and you're already ready to go. No, I don't. I'm like, so there. It's Romania. And you, of course, we're there. Look up this festival called Untold. Ooh, the Untold Festival. Looking it up right now. That sounds pretty epic. Oh, it's epic. Oh, it's this August. Transylvania, Romania. Oh, yes. Okay. All right. I still don't know what it's about, and it looks epic. It's like gothic te- arches like and fireflies. <gasps> really? Yeah. yeah oh, it is wow. like music. Oh, yeah. damn. Oh, yeah. David Guetta. David Guetta. Avicii used to play there before he died. Oh, look at these masks. <gasps> I want one of these masks. Oh, my God. You know what your admission gets you if you want? What? A free tattoo. We're so going. How do we go? (laughs) Yes. Oh my gosh. Techno music, cool dragon masks, a free tattoo with entry, light light shows shows. with all the music. No, you need, you need to look it up on YouTube and you're going to be like, fuck yeah. And go to Transylvania while you're there. Oh yeah. And then we're in Transylvania. I mean, we can definitely. Wow. Oh, wow. This looks like fun. Right? Isn't that like totally what we would be totally into? Oh, Oh, absolutely. So the GoFundMe is send the witches to Transylvania (laughs) for the Untold Festival. I'm sure we can raise the money for that. Exactly. I think the four of us should should try to, to hit that up. We definitely should. That looks like fun. Totally a next summer thing. I don't see why we wouldn't be able to. Always like around the first week of August, I think, every year. Nice. 
Wow, that looks like a lot of fun. I want to go. I'm so right? excited for festivals of all kinds to start up again. Fuck festivals in upstate New York. Transylvania, man. Transylvania festivals are where it's at. Absolutely. Oh my gosh, that does look like a lot of fun. Kick our music festival patronage up a notch. <laughs> go to Romania. Yeah, right. What was the last music festival we went to? Like Mother Earth or something? I, I guess it depends remember. on what kind of festival. What was the last? Um, we went to that one that had um, Snoop Dogg and um, Bone Thugs. Fuck you. It <laughs> <laughs> wasn't, really, wasn't really a festival. It was just like a multi-concert. Dr. Dre. Um, it wasn't really a festival, though. We you did really go to- suck. <laughs> we did go to some music or to some pop festivals that had music ice cube yeah we went so we went to a pot festival with ice cube just like <laughs> um but yeah i know like pagan music festivals the hour festival mother earth harvest moon harvest moon haven't been to those in a long time coachella is happening right up the road for me actually isn't that like a rich celebrity thing? Um, it really does seem to be that way. I thought before I got here, I thought Coachella was going to be, you know, it's the music and arts festival. And, and you always see people with flowers in their hair and dressed like hippies. And no, it's really just rich people cosplaying as hippies for the weekend. Sometimes there's really great music there. Don't get me wrong. But it's, yeah, but like it's the a different kind of vibe. Are there. Yeah. 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 They have, you know, VIP sections and everyone's trying to get their Instagram photo. And it's it's very much a different kind of vibe. Music is great. The festival is very you're not, commercial. You're not you're not buying your grilled cheese sandwich for three dollars from a guy who hasn't showered in a week. No, there's no shakedown street, right? <laughs> Festivals were fun. I miss it. But from what I've seen, it looks like it could be like that at Untold. It could be. That does look like a lot of fun. I mean, anything that's going to have those gothic arches and a laser light show and fireflies, that's interesting. I'm there. <laughs> I want to check it out. It could be fun. Not to mention, you know, Vlad the Impaler's castle. I bet there is probably a ghost or two there. What do you think? That's not even a question. Isn't I mean, that, isn't Romania where that one queen or or highborn lady that literally used to bathe in her maid's blood? It wasn't she there. Oh shoot, yeah. what was her name? Literally bathe in blood, like she'd kill her maids and have their blood drained into the bathtub. The Lady Bathory was it? Lady Bathory. I'd have to look. Hold on. Oh yeah, Lady Bathory. The Hungarian serial killer, Lady Bathory. She was a Hungarian noblewoman and supposedly a serial killer. She just felt like the blood made her skin look younger. That's all. Don't be hating. That was it, right? Don't don't be hating on her. She don't just, be hating. She, just, she just needed a wrinkle cream. That's all. She yeah. just don't we all I mean, need a little of that freshening up, you know? What's what's a couple maids here or there? Right. Who's gonna miss them? Oh. It's pretty terrible, actually. <laughs> but I don't I have no idea if that's anywhere near Romania or not. But that's who I think of when I think of like the whole vampire legend is Lady Bathory and her literal bathtubs full of blood. Actually, Romania borders Hungary. Oh, well, see, there you go. I guess my geography isn't too, too bad. Yeah, Romania is bordered by Moldova, Serbia, Hungary, and freaking Ukraine. So we got to let shit kind of settle there for a minute. Right? Yeah, I guess we won't be visiting. But yeah, that's just wild. Her whole story, just wild. Anyway, different podcast. Different podcast. Back to the U.S. I, you know, I remember we were talking about how you always reach for high THC. And we were talking a little bit about celebrity weed. And so I thought I'd go looking for some celebrity weed. And we mentioned. What did you find? Cheech and Chong were my idols as a teenager and a young stoner who didn't love them back in the day. Who doesn't still love them? Advocates oh for the cause. I mean, great guys. They're just a lot of fun. And apparently they have amazing weed. And I don't know if you remember, but I mentioned Fuchique Pesta, which means like what stinks or who farted in Spanish. Isn't it just Chong that has the weed? Isn't Cheech out of it? Isn't it just Chong that has the company? Nope, this is Cheech's stash. 
Fuchike pesto oh. is directly from Chicha Stash, and um, he does have a few different types. This one is a hybrid, and it has 32.3% THC shell, and I know you love the big THCs. Wow. How does it smoke? really good this stuff is great it certainly lives up to his name you open the bag and oh my god the aroma fabulous it hits you right in the like, face what's it smell like does it smell like skunk or flower like what's it smell like i would say a little Fruity. skunky kind of earthy you know it's got that little bit of really really heavy green smell and it just hits you right in the face slaps you right up the face and you're like oh yeah literally who farted what's that smell Fucci que pesta okay that sounds Fucci italian why do I sound Italian? That's bad. Fuchi que pesta. So Fuchi que pesta. Um, good stuff. A little purpley. Smokes really good. Is it dense or? It's dense. It's sticky. It's fabulous. Really great high. Great body high. A little expensive for me. And honestly. I was just going to ask you that. What is the price of Celebrity Weed? Celebrity Weed is pretty pricey. It's about $60 an eighth. Oh, that's what we pay here in Massachusetts. So that's just the norm. Yeah, I don't like that price. I've heard other places are a lot less expensive. And that's why I grow my own, man. That's that's expensive. That's crazy, crazy price. And I've had other weed. Okay, this is good. It's kind of purpley. It's dark. It's dense. It's sticky. And the smell literally does smack you in the face with that kind of earthy, skunky goodness. What'd you and say it was? 32%? 32%. Yep. 32.3%. It's good. Definitely very stony, body high, good stuff. I would say more on the indica side of a hybrid, you know, really buzzy and relaxy. However, I can get that same really good, wonderful, but not quite so expensive, you know. But like you said, that's pretty much if you're going to buy top shelf, that's what you're going to pay if you want the higher THCs. And as we all know, sometimes it's not always the THC percentage, but the other terpenes and different chemicals that are in there that can interact and give you different types of high. So even though Shell and I do tend to, to reach for the smack in the face, higher THCs, you can sometimes get a, a longer lasting high, a better high, a more body high, a buzzier high from lower THCs. Uh, with different terpenes, which is why having a great bud tender makes all the difference. You really need to talk to someone who smoked it, who knows the experience. Bud tenders are key. So do you think that you really ultimately were paying more for the name as opposed to the quality of marijuana? I, I have to actually give it to Cheech in this aspect. I would say it's just as good as other top shelf and no more than other top shelf. So, and, and as far as packaging goes, just a little simple seal pack is, is far preferable to the plastic that's shrink wrapped in a cardboard box that's also shrink wrapped that's in another plastic seal pack. I would say it was really good. It was very enjoyable. Honestly, because I'm, I'm paying a, the same price pretty much on the regular uh, here, I would be interested to try to get my hands on that to see if it's any better than the normal $60 eighths I'm getting here. Right. Good point. Because you are continuously grabbing from that top shelf and smoking it. Whereas I go back and forth between, I like to try a lot of different types and different price points just to see where things are at. Plus I supplement a lot with my own weed. So I have a little bit of a different perspective. So I'd be curious to see what your take on this. And again, I wish I could just send it to you. Why can't I just ship this to you and be like, Hey, Shell, I tried this great shit out. Why don't you get a buzz and tell me what you think? I would love get to a do that. in the mail. Right? That's, it's just not fair. I should be able to overnight ship this to you. Roll up a joint, send it to you. We could smoke together and you could tell me. You know, um, in, in honor of our, our 420 episode, um, I did want to mention uh, since we last met for our podcast, the bill, what did it, it passed the Senate and needs to go to the House or pass the House and needs to go to the Senate, something like that. But it, it's a step, it is a step closer to that, that federal acceptance. And then if that were to happen, you could pop a bud in an envelope and ship it to me. If that were to happen. <laughs> Yeah, that would be nice. Let's see. Which one was it? It was the, so it passed the House and, and then it has to go to the Senate. Then it's also got to go to the president after that. And I guess Democrats are working on another legalization bill. So even if this one fails somewhere, which it doesn't look like it's going to cross, you know, knock on wood. They'll have one. They'll have another one. One waiting, a plan B in the wings. Oddly enough, Chuck Schumer, I mean, 
I didn't think I'd ever say this, but you know, New York, go Chuck Schumer. <laughs> you want to know why? Don't give the man credit. He's a greedy motherfucker and he sees what Massachusetts is making and he is jelly. He's like, show me the money. You know, you're probably right. I'm not an adult yet. We all know this. And I'm coming to realize that no one is. And there's no such thing as good guys or bad guys. There just isn't. No one is just a good guy or just a bad guy. It just doesn't happen like that. And that was one of those false things we were taught as children that like somebody pulled out of their ass and they're like, this sounds good. Let's teach this to our kids. So let me tell you about my 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 420. Yes, what are you smoking for this wonderful high holiday? I keep forgetting to mention that it's 420. I mean, 420. What did you get, Shell? The score of the year. Ooh, do tell. Obviously, I know you're not used to having to pay what we pay for (laughs) premium quality marijuana here. True. But so generally, more often than not, uh, what you're looking at in, in the state of Massachusetts is about 60 bucks an eighth. I can't tell you the other prices because I generally go eighth by eighth. They do on occasion, you know, I've, I've talked on previous podcasts, my complaints about how some stores charge 60 and then tax, and then some, the, some stores charge 60, which already includes the tax. For the same grade weed, right? Right, right. So, you know, I already have that dilemma here. Right. So the store with the good pricing, we'll, we'll actually shout them out because I just love them. Happy Valley. What a great name for a weed store. Happy Valley. It works. It totally works. So they do have have some that are maybe a little lower than 60 on occasion. We'll call it a quote unquote sale. Who doesn't love a good sale? I mean, come on. Right? We all love to save a buck, especially on cannabis. So I go up there yesterday and of course they're having their, their big 420 week sale and they have mix and match any eight eighths for 288, which is any actually eight eighths. Oh shit. What's eight times 60? Hold on. Let me get the calculator out. 480. Here. Isn't that 480? Yes. Yeah, so eight I times basically- 60. Isn't that 480? Holy cow. That's a deal. Right? Like I saved like almost That's two ounces for $280. <gasps> oh, no, wait. Eight one eighths. Ounce. That's one ounce. One, one ounce. ounce. One ounce for $280. Which. Okay, I can do some math. <laughs> you were close. Still was close. a deal. Still like, a I, deal. I saved like $196. Mm-hmm. Eight top shelf eighths. Nice. And <laughs> because they have such good quality weed at Happy Valley. You could only get two of the same cultivar. And I'm like, I know what a cultivar is because Layla taught me. I'm like, I'm like, that's a flavor. I know what that is. Of course I know what that means. <laughs> Good for you. That's fantastic. I feel I feel accomplished now. Hey, I, I, you're you're educating me. It's a slow and steady <laughs> uphill climb, but it's happening. We'll get you there. So what I'm smoking today out of my mix and match eight for eight for 288 i have lime og which is this batch is 28.27 thc and that's actually the lowest thc out of the mix and match choices i made nice to have that as the low bar is pretty sweet i went back to good old standbys you know, when I love something, I ride that wave. So I, I got some uh, super lemon OG. Love a lemon. I love a lemon. And I got White Wedding in Jasmine Silver Haze. Oh, yeah. Don't get me started on Silver Hazes. A bitch to grow. Bitch to grow, but so, so good. So Why good. are they hard to grow? Sativas are sativas are picky bitches they're picky picky bitches uh they take forever they like their light a certain way their temperature and humidity a certain way they like their newts just right get them off a little bit and she'll start to show signs of stress or nutrient burn or nutrient deficiency and and then once you have one little problem with a fucking sativa then it cascades into more problems they are picky bitches so are indicas just more weedy, easy to grow, kind of res- honestly, more resilient? Honestly, yes. 
Um, some some cultivars are more resilient than others too. And and yeah, there are some sativas that are easy to grow and there are some indicas that are picky bitches. But most of the time sativas, uh, shit, what are they called? Autoflower sativas aren't as bad. They don't take as long, but they still take a long time. But photoperiod sativas can take a long, long time, like four months in just in flower, three, four months, just from the time they start to flower. And that's a long time, particularly now when people are used to, you know, three month turnover with auto flowers or less, you know, even less. After four months, you're starting to panic. Right. And that can take up, you know, sometimes I would have just a couple of them in my garden and they can take up a lot of space. You know, you have to tie them down. They get very, very tall. They get very tall and stretchy. And so you have to accommodate for that in your garden. If you're growing other indicas that are short, now you've got weird light situations. So then you have to use some type of low stress, low stress training or LST and tie them down to kind of try and keep an even canopy, like a sea of green kind of canopy. What a pain in the ass. They are a pain in the ass. Worth it. Delicious, fabulous high. A lot of growers will keep those as their head stash, as their personal stash, because you just they're can't. They're that good. They're that good. And you're just not going to get the return that you deserve for the amount of time and care. And again, there's a <laughs> lot of new things that make that easier. Autoflowers definitely simplify that process. You can still get sativas. And honestly, hybrids are way more popular. And now we've gone off on a growing tangent. Holy shit. So tell me more about your 8 eighth Shell. <laughs> <laughs> so like these these are like really you know high quality for the for the deal 28.84 thc for the silver haze nice they what is this white wedding 34.64 damn girl like some big so you know actually i feel like that that white wedding that if you recall from a few podcasts ago the Cannabis Cup, Massachusetts, 2021, high times, first place, white wedding. Nice. Also, I have the Cannabis Cup, uh, high times, first place in a different category of the Super Lemon Haze. And that was 31.12. You know, it's not like these deals are on like the 16%. This this like mix and match eight eighths is like for the good quality shit. Like I feel... Like I went to a thrift store and found gold. Nice. And you still spent almost $300. <laughs> yeah, but I saved so much that it's worth it. It was so worth it because it, it's not like I'm not going to smoke it too. Right. Right. It's going to get smoked. Absolutely. So that's pretty good. So yeah, we're smoking on a lot. Not so many um, edibles or, you know, dabs this time. Mostly flour, mostly flour for this 420. Yeah, I'm I'm doing my traditional stick with my pretty little pipe for for my 420 ce- celebrations. So tell us how you guys are celebrating 420. Did you buy anything special? Did you buy anything extra? Are you planning on going to a park and smoking in public if it's legal where you are? Did you make brownies for the first time? You know, what's what's your 420 celebration? It is a Wednesday. That's true. But if you're out there and you're smoking and you're celebrating connect with us, email us, send us a picture. Yeah. Yeah. Send us a picture of your packed, whatever your, your packed bong, your packed pipe, your, show us your glass, show us your silicone, show us your, show us your smoking apparatus, show us what you're smoking, show us what you're smoking. I'd love to see that. Happy 420. Happy 420. Anyway. I, 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 what's your story today? I know that we, we talked a lot about, about weed today and 420 stuff and celebrating 420, but we were going to put in, put in some, some actual ghosty ghoulies. Yes. And this is a big story. I'm going to try and keep it as short as I possibly can, but there is so much to the story. This is a story that actually I have been following since the mid nineties. Back in the mid nineties, I was on the internet all the time and was constantly looking for witchy stuff. You know, it was a young witch myself. And when the only, the only witchy site you could find back then was the witch's voice. Remember the witch's voice website? They're still up. They're actually still a presence online. 
go witch box. Right. And I do remember looking for different sites, different message boards, different places where I could meet witches, other witches, whether across the country or where I was, I was new to my area right around the same time I met you. Yeah. And, um, so I was new to where I was living. I was trying to find pagans anywhere. And at that time it was very difficult to find anyone who was a pagan. It was difficult to be out of the broom closet, quote unquote. And, and so I did connect with people online and that's where I met a lot of people and eventually met you and the local pagan group in the area. So I happened to stumble across a story out of a, a city called West Memphis in Arkansas, where um, three young boys had been murdered and there were three local teens that were accused of the crime. And it was a big Satanist story that what was it? Didn't they call it like the West Memphis three or something? If yes, I kind of exactly. Recall. This is about the West Memphis three. I vaguely remember that from like the news back then. It actually became a three part documentary on HBO that kind of blew up the story and, and became famous with Johnny Depp, with Eddie Vedder from Pearl Jam, with um, uh, one of the Dixie Chicks and all these people joined this cause. And I, I'll get to that, but I'll tell you why. But before it was even a documentary, the, the boys were on trial and I found it because one of them at the time was Wiccan and was was into witchcraft. So at the time, the fact that he was Wiccan and into witchcraft was paraded as proof positive that he was a Satanist. And he was even quoted in articles at the time talking about the goddess and talking about Wicca and it being an earth based religion. And, and it blew my mind because no one talked about it at that time. And here is a young man who was a witch just like me who was exploring Wicca just like I was at the time. And he was being literally persecuted for a murder that he didn't commit and called a Satanist because of his beliefs. So I was, I was drawn into the story and they were, were they found, teenagers? they were 16, 17 and 18 at the time. They were um, Damien Eccles, Jesse Miss Kelly and Jason Baldwin. Damien Eccles was the young man at the time who was 18 and who was accused of being a Satanist. He was actually under the care of a social worker because he did have a lot of he had a lot of depression, he had some mental health issues. And so he was under the care of a social worker. Jerry Driver was a juvenile probation officer for Crittenden County, and he was obsessed with Satanism. This social worker literally would drive around at night of full moons looking for Satanist activity. The guy saw Satanists in every fucking shadow. And this is right at the end of, do you remember the satanic panic that was going on in the eighties? Like every freaking yep. daycare, they were yep. Satanists. Every other star was a Satanist. And Satanists, they were like, Satan <laughs> is hidden in every nook and cranny of society. It was like the eighties version of the witch hunts. Exactly, exactly. So this was the early nineties, again, tail end of the, of the satanic panic, but it was still there. We knew people who would not say that they were pagan or Wiccan or witches because of legitimate fear of losing their job or losing their children or, or having people of a town work against them. And here's proof positive that it was happening. And then in 1996, the HBO documentary, but let's rewind for a moment. I'm going to take a toke. Let's rewind and I'm going to tell you the story. Okay. And I'm, 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 I'm curious about this because this is all sort of time. You and I happen to have the same job at the same company at that particular point in history. Correct. Right around there. And people used to think that we were just batshit crazy because we would go to work in that particular environment and wear our pentacles and they were like, oh, my God, how can you do that? And we're like, loud and proud, motherfuckers. We kind of relied, maybe very naively, but it worked out for us. We relied on our constitutional right and made it a point to point out that, that was our constitutional right, freedom of religion. But there was a lot of people that we knew and, and were a part of the, the local community with that couldn't accept how open you and I were at that time. I was in the newspaper at that time. We all were. Remember we were on the front page? We were on the front page wearing regular clothes, using our real names, our legal names. And it caused a big stir, not only because we were willing to be on the front page, but because everyone's like, you look so normal. 
And we're like, well, this is how we do ritual, motherfucker. We just wear, you know, everyone thought you had to dress up and wear weird clothes. And, and, and of course, that's fun. Don't get me wrong. I love to dress up in ritual garb. But I, had to work, I had to work all day and I got to take my kid to a softball practice. I ain't got time to change clothes. You're, exactly. you're, I'm doing ritual in my work clothes here, people. We were <laughs> one of the first groups to show people that witches were just regular people. They could be people who just went to a circle in their work clothes after work and before picking up their kids to to give thanks and 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 it opened the eyes of a lot of people but we were not hidden we were not in the broom closet and like you said loud and proud we wore our pentacles and a lot of people thought we were outing them as well they felt like we were outing the greater local community and they were angry at us there were people that were angry at us because we chose not to be hidden in any sort of closet per se. But we never, never would give anyone up because again, we knew that the possibility that people could lose their children over this. We were lucky enough to both have partners who are witches at that time. And so we knew that that wasn't something that could happen. We were safe in that. But we also knew that other people were not so safe. People were losing children because they practice Wicca or witchcraft. And and that was a legitimate fear. They just kind of misplaced it onto us. But somehow you and I, we were just very defiant against that stereotype. Very, very defiant so. against that stereotype. I mean, I remember back in that day, people would be like, you can't be a witch. You're not wearing black. Well, right. when I went to the store, I liked that shirt. And that has nothing to do with my religion. I just liked it. And I exactly. bought it. And now I'm wearing it. People were under the impression at that point that, you know, almost like that gothic look. It was like, right. oh, you know, we, we were the original assumed gothic people. Well, if you're a witch, you have to be wearing dark makeup and dark clothes and combat boots. I've never owned a pair of combat boots in my life, people. I, I have. I still do. <laughs> But the point is, is that, you know, we kind of, we bucked that stereotype. They saw us in nice shirts and nice pants and, you know, not that ritual garb isn't nice, but it, they saw we were in us business, in, We were in work business clothes. We were in soccer mom clothes. Um, we were in PTA clothes. Exactly. And it helped people to see that witches are just people. We're just people who have a different set of beliefs than you do. Nothing different. And in Damien Eccles case, the young man in, in that is part of the West Memphis three, his belief in, in witchcraft led to people literally calling him a Satanist and blaming him for these deaths. But, you know, he, he was at a disadvantage as well, because not that rural upstate New York was super pleasant and diverse friendly, but the South here is this, this teenager in the deep South, you know, in the Bible belt saying he's wicked, super conservative, super religious, super Baptist. Exactly. And he stood out like a sore thumb because that's the Bible belt. And to them, he was Satan. He was literally, they called him that. So here's what happened. So it's 1993, May 5th, 1993, three young boys, Chris Byers, Michael Moore, and Stevie Branch, uh, local eight-year-olds. They were all second graders. They were in Boy Scouts together, uh, well-known by the neighborhood, loved to play together. They were together that afternoon. They were supposed to be home by 5 p.m. At least one of the boys was supposed to be home by 5 p.m. Right around 4.30ish, they were all seen, two of them on bikes, going towards a local wooded area, you know, just behind the houses the kids like to play in. It was kind of between the suburb and a truck stop. And it was kind of a like a creek, like a river drainage ditch that ran through a wooded area. And I feel like every kid has grown up with some sort of scenery like that. Exactly. Yeah. The best place to play in when you are a young kid. Eight-year-old, fucking catnip. Place like right that. To the creek, man. Going to the creek. To the woods and the creek. So they were seen headed that way. The place was called Robin Hood Hills by the local people. And so they were seen going towards Robin Hood Hills. Some people saw them headed that way around 6 p.m. on May 5th. And some people also recall seeing Terry Hobbs, the stepfather to, to Stevie Branch, one of the boys, calling them to come home right around that same time. However, they didn't come home. Around 8 p.m., the boys were reported missing by John Mark Byers, who was the adoptive father of Christopher Byers. 8.10, the police got to John's house 
and questioned him. By 8.30, John Mark Byers is out looking for his son and the other boys. 9 p.m., the mother, Pamela Hobbs, of one of the other boys, Stevie Branch, she gets home from work, is told by her husband, Terry Hobbs, who's Stevie's stepfather, that he hasn't seen the boy all day. So now she's worried. And the other mother, Dana Moore, at this time, 9 p.m., both of them report the boys missing, and everyone starts to look for the boys. 6 a.m. the next morning, the boys are officially declared missing by the chief inspector of the West Memphis Police Department, a gentleman named Gary Gitchell. And there's video. There's quite a bit of video of this. There's actually a documentary called Paradise Lost. It's the first part of three. And I did see this documentary in 1996, which was after uh, the West Memphis Three had been convicted of these crimes. But anyway, so you can see that video if you want to. It is online. So there's search parties looking for the boys. You can see uh, a couple of the mothers. You can see uh, the one adoptive father, um, John Mark Byers, in the video. And they're searching for these kids and can't find them. So around 1.45 in the afternoon, one of the searchers is in Robin Hood Hills near the creek, and he sees what he thinks is a sneaker on the bank opposite. And he goes to reach for it and kind of falls, steps into the creek. Now, picture a small small river, small creek. Uh, they call it a drainage ditch sometimes, but it literally looks like a little river that runs through this small woods. And the area where this gentleman is looks like it could be a small swimming hole. Um, when he's in the water, it's up to the top of his thighs. So an eight-year-old boy or a young kid, it would be pretty deep, you know, a decent place to go swimming. Potentially waist high. Exactly. So it, when you hear drainage ditch, it's not tiny. It literally has places you could a, a kid could swim and play in. So he kind of falls in and, and steps into the water to reach the opposite, opposite bank to get the sneaker that he sees. And in doing so, his foot gets tangled in what he thinks might be roots or a log underneath. And so he gets the shoe and as he's stepping out, he kind of falls backwards. And what he's actually tangled on is the one of the bodies of one of the boys. Oh, Jesus. So they find in that, in that hole uh, where he had found the shoe, they find two of the boys, Stevie and Christopher were there. And then a little bit further down, they found uh, the other boy, Michael Moore. And all three boys were naked. And they had been tied, hog tied with their hands behind their back, their left wrist to their left ankle and their right wrist to their right ankle with their shoelaces. Um, the boys appeared to have quite a few wounds on them. One of the boys, Christopher Byers, um, had multiple scratches and bruises all over his body and what appeared to be bite marks. And also his, his scrotum and the skin of his penis had been ripped from his body. Oh my God. Stevie Branch, his cheek was torn off, and he had multiple also stab what looked to be stab wounds, scratches, and bruising. And Michael Moore, uh, who was the boy that was found a little bit further away, he appeared to be the least injured of all the boys, but he also had extensive bruising and scratches and what appeared to be puncture wounds. The autopsy, you can find all of the autopsy information online. Christopher Byers um, died of multiple skull fractures. He had bruising on both of his ears and around his eyes, and he had fractures um, on his face and the base of his skull. And the coroner determined that that is what had killed him. The other two boys also had, um, it looked like they had been beaten extensively in the head, and they all had multiple skull fractures that would have killed them, according to the coroner, but their cause of death was drowning. Oh. Yeah. So the, the brutal manner that the boys appeared to have died, their, their brutal wounds, the fact that they were naked and they were tied, their, their clothes were found like whoever had killed them had taken their clothes and wrapped them around like logs like and sticks and shoved it into the creek to kind of hide it so they wouldn't be found. Weird. Right? According to reports, there was a social worker on the scene when the boys were found and he said that it looked like satanic activity. And it, this is Damien Eccles, social worker, who again was obsessed with Satanism. Oh, God. I don't know why he decided this was a satanic ritual, but he's like, looks like Satanism. I know just the guy. Did, did anybody look into that guy? Just saying. <laughs> right? I don't know, but honestly. Don't call me an investigator, but I'm just throwing out ideas. Right? <laughs> They almost immediately... Now, normally when a child dies, who do they look at first? 
parents. Exactly. Do you know who they never looked at? Especially because it sounds like some of them had step parents and adoptive parents, which is technically, statistically, not all the time, don't be flooding our mail, but statistically speaking, abuse would happen more by an adoptive parent or a step parent more so than a biological parent. And it seems like at least two of these three children, if not all three, had either a step parent or an adoptive parent. So I'd be like, Hey, adoptive dad, what you been up to? Hey, guy. Hey, stepdad. They never look at the parents. And here is the second greatest tragedy of this murder is that the police immediately jumped to the Satanism angle. And if you watch the first documentary, the townspeople were more than ripe for this type of bullshit they were seeing Satanists everywhere. They were convinced that these boys who wore black and listened to Metallica and read Stephen King, and one of them was into Wicca, they were convinced that these kids were Satanists. That was us. We wore black. We were into Metallica. Yeah. We read books about Wicca. Stephen King, man, the stand. How can you, how can you hate that? Exactly. Oh my God. So all of this, the main evidence was just the suggestion of the social worker? That's where it started. They did question Damien Eccles in the beginning and let him go. He said he didn't know the boys, had never heard of them. Where things kind of went sideways was there was a woman, uh, Victoria Hutchinson, I believe her name was, is. She wanted to play detective and she decided she was going to crack this case and even described herself as a, as a detective and was going to help the police. Her son, who was a, a playmate of the boys who had been killed, was babysat by a young man who lived in her apartment building, Jesse Miss Kelly. Jesse Miss Kelly has a below average or um, very limited IQ. She said that um, she wanted to know more about Damien Eccles because she felt he was a Satanist, like a lot of kids, like a lot of people in town did. And so she asked Jesse Miss Kelly to introduce her to Damien Eccles. Jesse didn't really know Damien and Jason Baldwin, um, the other two boys as part of the West Memphis Three. They were familiar with each other from school, but didn't really hang out. So she recorded a conversation with them where she tried to get them to talk about the murders and they just didn't really, nothing ever really came of it. However, the police did bring Jesse Miss Kelly in for questioning. Again, Jesse's 17 years old and has the comprehension of a six or seven year old. His father gave permission for him to be spoken to by the police. Basically, the police are like, we just want to ask your son some questions. And there's a reward if he knows anything and can lead us to the killers. And so dad said, okay, by various accounts, they questioned Jesse Miss Kelly alone, unrecorded for anywhere between two and a half and 12 hours, depending on which account you believe. Is that legal? Technically, they asked his father for permission and the father gave verbal permission. Today, none of that would be allowed. None of that would be allowed. There was no lawyer present. They only recorded 30 minutes at the very end of all of their questioning. And in that 30 minutes, he supposedly confessed and said that he and Damien Eccles and Jason Baldwin had gone to the Robin Hood Hills to drink and decided to attack these boys and kill them in a Satan, Satanistic manner. He claimed that Damien and Jason sexually assaulted these boys and that he only helped hold them down and tie them up. And that the boys, cho uh, that Damien and Jason choked the boys with sticks as well as beat them up and stabbed them multiple times and mutilated them. Again, one of the boys scrotum and penis skin had been ripped off and one boy's cheek had been ripped off. So they basically coerced a mentally inept person. Yes. Into an elaborate story that fit their need. Very much so. And according to the expert that testified for the defense, and even if you just look at the transcripts, all of the transcripts and information are available online. And I will put a link where you can do all your own research if you'd like to. Um, but the, the expert testified it's, it's extremely obvious that they led this boy 
if he didn't say what they wanted him to say, like they asked him what time it happened and he said 9 a.m. And they're like, well, well, what time did you actually get together? Wasn't it in the afternoon? And he's like, oh yeah, it was in the afternoon. And they're like, well, wasn't it dark? Didn't you say earlier it was eight or nine? And he'd say, oh yeah, it was eight or nine. And they would keep leading him to the answer they wanted him to give. And they also, when the expert was questioned as to how he knew about the injuries of the boys, the police had already admitted that they had been showing him pictures, you know, in the two and a half or 12 hours prior to the recording, they had told him everything they needed him to know. And he just kind of regurgitated it. Investigators later to prove that how easy it is to get him to confess actually got him to confess to a bank robbery that he had nothing to do with because it's just that easy to kind of lead someone, particularly someone who's eager to please and has a a low IQ. False confessions happen, especially now we know this. And back in the 90s, the coercion tactics that they used weren't as known about as they are now. So this very obviously fake confession was all they had to go on to convict these boys. And again, rumors in the town ran rampant and the police did nothing to stop them. They talked about that one of the boys' testes were found in a jar under Damien's bed, which was absolutely not true, completely fake. At this point, film crews following these kids around and you, the documentary is very biased towards the West Memphis Three being innocent. And I do feel that they're innocent, but just keep in mind when you watch the documentary, it's extremely biased towards them being innocent. So keep that in mind. The boys were convicted, one, and Damien Eccles was sentenced to death. However, when Jesse was tried, he was tried separately from Damien and Jason. And in, it, in his trial, they used his confession against him, even though he had immediately recanted the confession and told people that they had told him if he gave up the killers, he could buy his dad a truck because there was a $35,000 reward and he'd be able to pay off all of his dad's debts. Wow. <laughs> so he was found guilty. However, it was determined that they could not use his confession in the trial against Jason Baldwin and Damian Eccles. They really didn't have any evidence against the two of them other than that confession. So they did use some other things uh, in the trial. Jason Baldwin was being held and this other gentleman, Michael Carson, was being held with him at the same time. And Michael Carson testified in court that he had had a private moment with Jason Baldwin where he'd asked Jason if he had done it. And Jason said yes, and then described that he had dismembered the boys, cut off their scrotum and put their testicles in his mouth. And so he testified that, that Jason had told him that in private and that was used against them in trial. However, one of Michael Carson's doctors had tried to call the court and contact the lawyers and let them know that he had been the one who had told Michael Carson those details to try and scare him into doing well in therapy, saying, you know, if you get sent over to detention, you're going to have to be with this guy who did this to these little boys. So saying this is how he got the information. He he didn't get it from Jason Baldwin. He was never alone with Jason Baldwin. It's provable that he was never alone with him. And I, I'm the source of where he got that information. And they didn't allow that. Wow. Jason and Damien were found guilty. And it was found later that the jury foreman, Kent Arnold, had actually had quite a bit of knowledge of the confession of Jesse Miss Kelly and brought it to the attention of the jurors in the deliberation room, even though he wasn't supposed to. And in conversations with his own lawyer that have also come to light in the early 2000s, this jury foreman was actually trying to get them convicted because he felt that Damien Eccles was a Satanist and that Jesse Miss Kelly's confession was true. They have um, sheets, you know, where the, where the jury was writing out notes when they were deliberating. And one of the lines in the notes was completely blacked out. And they, they got one of the jurors notebooks where she had copied that list. And that line wasn't blacked out in her list. And it was Jesse Miss Kelly's confession, which was never supposed to have been brought to the attention of the jurors. So this was one big fabrication, really, from the get go, start to finish. The police at the time were absolutely convinced that Damien Eccles, Jason Baldwin, and Jesse and Miss Kelly had done this, even though they had been the ones that had coerced this confession. What led them 
why did why did why did Damien Eccles get the death penalty and the other two didn't? I believe it it was because he was eighteen. And they also oh. felt that he was the ringleader and he was the only one that was 18. So he was, he was um, gotcha. sentenced to death and they were sentenced to life in prison without parole. I gotcha. Okay. I didn't, I didn't, okay. I didn't realize that part. I was like, what the hell did they do that for? Especially since to be honest with you, none of them probably did it anyway. Right. Right. So the chief inspector of the police department, Gary Gitchell, it seemed like he was on a fucking crusade. He was determined to be the cool guy. He was going to solve this. And and this had gotten national attention even before the documentary. And you should see some of the shit the reporters asked these people. They A reporter literally asked one of the mothers if she was considering joining her son. And when she acted confused, he's like, suicide? Do you think you're going to commit suicide? The attention that this case got was crazy and Gary Gitchell was eating it up and he was determined to be the white knight savior in this super Baptist town. They asked him after this confession, they brought in the three boys, the West Memphis three. They asked Gary Gitchell on a scale of one to 10, how sure are you of this conviction? And he said, I'm an 11. And you can see the self smug satisfaction. He's so sure of himself. And in that moment, he convinced himself he's absolutely right beyond a shadow of a doubt and he literally references that same moment multiple times i've seen it in at least three or four different interviews with him where he says they one time asked me on a scale of one to ten how sure was i and i said i was an 11. you can just see he loved that moment and he repeats it over and over and over again so more evidence came out and better dna technology came out and they've determined that none of the dna that they found like on a hair that was tied in with the shoelaces that were used to tie the boys um none of that dna matched west memphis three it did match terry hobbs the stepfather of one of the victims and another hair found nearby on their clothing matched uh, terry hobbs's best friend i told you but it didn't match the west memphis three so People have been trying. The one defense attorney uh, for Jesse Miss Kelly never let this go. That guy, freaking amazing. He doggedly, he used his own money. This was like his first murder case he ever defended. And he tried everything to get these boys free. And he stayed on this for decades until they were finally, more evidence came in. Um, Stars got involved. Again, Johnny Depp, Eddie Vedder, the Dixie Chicks, because this was obviously a miscarriage of justice. Every time um, Damien Eccles or Jason Baldwin would bring this up in front of the judge, the same judge that had sentenced them, he would deny them the right to a retrial. He would deny the addition of new evidence. Why were they stuck in front of the same court and the same judge time and time again? The judge's name is David Burnett. And he supposedly said that he postponed a run for state Senate so that he could be the one to preside over their numerous appeals. It even went, it finally, when they got this DNA evidence, it finally went to to the Arkansas um, Supreme Court. Supreme Court. Yep. And I guess at this time, the judge that had been presiding over it since the original trial had gotten elected to the Senate. And so there was a new judge in place as well. These guys just don't want to admit that they made a mistake. And even when they this DNA evidence was presented and the state was given the choice to retry them. They basically told the guys, you can spend the next several years in jail during which time Damien Eccles might be executed, or you can take what's called an Alford plea. And what this Alford plea is, is they basically say, yes, you're right. We were guilty, but you're just going to let us off with the time we already served. And we state that we're innocent, which is so weird. So they were like, yes, I'm actually innocent, but I will plead guilty to time served and so that you'll let me out. And basically that was all so that the state wouldn't have to pay them reparations because there's so much evidence to show that these guys are innocent and had nothing to do with it. That if they did go to retrial and were acquitted, they would, these three men would be owed millions. They spent 18 years in jail for a crime that they didn't commit. And the real killer so much evidence was lost and mishandled and it's even now today there's this past february again this defense attorney that wouldn't let go found evidence that the sheriff's department had said was lost for decades found it and is trying to get them 
to allow him to use new DNA technology to test it and they won't let him do it. It's just crazy mismanagement and, and old boys club. Mind boggling. And this Gary Gitchell guy just in, in like 2010 or 2011, I guess was interviewed again. And he's like, you know, this is after the West Memphis three had been released. He's like, I still think they're guilty. I'm an 11 out of, you know, a scale of one to 10. I'm still at an 11. And if these stars just came and talked to me, I know I could convince them that, that they're guilty, that these guys are guilty. And the reporter said, well, isn't all the evidence out there? Yes. You know, isn't, isn't everything that you, is there something that the sheriff's office knows that they haven't talked about that proves that these guys are guilty? And, and the officer had to say, no, there is no evidence. There is nothing special. But even going through as much evidence as I could find online, and every single document is available online, there's nothing to tie these three men to this other than satanic panic and a sheriff that was determined to close a case. Shut the case down so the community settles down. Do what you can to calm the masses. Exactly. And these three poor boys, the documentary started to try and point a finger towards... um, not Hobbs. The, the documentaries point more towards the the adoptive father because he's he's always there. He always was in the spotlight. Anytime there's anything about these kids comes up, he's there. His wife, um, the boy's mother, uh-huh. died three years after her son died under unusual circumstances. Uh, and oh. he he mentions in an interview when he says, "When my wife was murdered by who?" Right. So John Mark Byers, the adoptive father to Christopher Byers, looks a lot very guilty in these documentaries because he he's he's a little out there. He very extreme views, very religious, prone to spouting off religious views, setting things on fire and and just generally acting really odd. But they already had their conviction. So they already had their convictions of the three guys. And he was determined that the West Memphis three were guilty. However, when the new DNA evidence came out, he even changed his tune. And he basically said, I was wrong. He he said, I said since the beginning, if evidence showed that they were innocent, then I'll go with it. And he says, evidence shows now that they're innocent. And he believes that Terry Hobbs, because it was his DNA that was found on the, the shoelace, the other reason speculation has gone to, to Terry Hobbs is his now ex-wife, Pamela, um, at the time that the boys were killed, Terry Hobbs and Pamela Hobbs were fighting. She was mad at him because he had been caught cheating on her. I, I watched a video with him where he talks about beating her and her deserving it and that he was mad at her because she was kissing a guy supposedly in their house and that he was going to get even. He has a very violent past and is known to be violent with her. Oh, who's to say? Well, and his DNA. And his DNA. She now says she thinks he did it. And the reason, one of the biggest re- reasons why is that she says that her son, her son, Stevie Branch, had a pocket knife that he carried with him everywhere that had belonged to his grandfather. And he never left home without that pocket knife. The pocket knife was not recovered with his clothing at the scene. Two pairs of the boy's underwear were missing and this pocket knife were missing. She found that pocket knife in Terry Hobbs's drawer and he had never told her that he had it. And she doesn't know why he would have it. She had long thought that the killer had taken that pocket knife and she found it later. The killer probably did take the pocket knife, bitch. And she found it. And she it's a, in a statement. Again, you can find it online and I'll have a link to it. In a statement, she says to the police, she describes that knife and says why she thinks Terry Hobbs should be a suspect because of that pocket knife. Wow. I hope she divorced him. She did. She did. So, yeah, there's a lot of video out there. There's a lot of information. It's it's what happened to him. To who? They're not still in- the, the the three they're the not West still Memphis in prison. three no they took that Alfred plea in 2011 and were released and they have been released since then Jesse Miss Kelly I believe is still living in West Memphis uh, he keeps a very low profile he doesn't have any social media you can snail mail him there is an address you can mail him through in care of another person the um, Damien Eccles has written quite a few books he's been active he's on social media online he's he's done quite a few. Um, 
interviews with people, you can find those. He did live in Salem, Massachusetts for a while. Louisiana, I believe he lives in New York City now. I'm not 100% sure. He's been married, actually, for quite a long time. He and his wife married in while he was in prison, and they're still together. Very cute story. I heard he wrote the lyrics to a Pearl Jam song. He did. He he co-wrote the lyrics to a Pearl Jam song. Eddie Vedder was instrumental in helping to bring this to a lot of people's attention and and getting, you know, getting the guys to the point where they could take an Alfred plea. And uh, Jason Baldwin, I believe he lives in Austin, Texas, and he works, uh, I don't know if he's founded it or if he works with it, but he works with a, a group, a nonprofit that helps people who were wrongly convicted uh, to try and oh, wow. get them free. Yeah. So the guys are definitely doing a lot. Damien Eccles doesn't say if he's a witch or a Hindu or a Christian now. He says they're all the same. All religions are the same. He does he practice magic. He's a spiritual person. Very much so. And he does have several books out, including a new one called High Magic, A Guide to the Spiritual Practices That Saved My Life on Death Row. There's a foreword by Eddie Vedder, and that came out in 2018. I believe that was his most recent book, came out in 2018. But just a travesty of the fact that from the very beginning in the, the crime scene footage that you can see when they found the bodies of these boys, which, fair warning, if you watch these documentaries, they do show actual footage of these boys as they pull them out of the creek and on the side of the creek. And they show quite graphic autopsy photos and photos of these kids. So I couldn't watch a lot of it. I'm not good at that. (laughs) So just to let you know, fair warning, there is a lot of that. You will get graphic, graphic views of these children as they're found. Um, But the amount of people in and out of that creek, they didn't retain any of that water. And there were a lot of theories about the fact that there wasn't a lot of blood found at the scene. Maybe they had been carted somewhere else and then brought back there. They thought a lot of the wounds were bite marks or stab wounds when it turns out um, upon further investigation that those were actual animal predation post-mortem, including the extreme damage to the one boy's genitals and the other boy's face. All of that had actually been done after they were dead and in the water. Um, The turtle activity there is what accounted for the major bite marks, the scratches. Basically, the boys were killed by blows to the head and drowning. And the rest of the wounds were all done by turtles. Turtles? Turtles. I didn't realize turtles were that freaking violent. They really are. They really are. And in that area, other investigators did lower uh, raw chickens carcasses into the water. And within literal minutes of the carcasses hitting the water, the turtles came out from everywhere and started clawing and biting at the carcasses. Like zombie turtles? <laughs> no, just turtle turtles. Experts have reviewed these photos since and do very strongly feel that most of those marks were caused after the boys had died and that their actual cause of death was being beaten about the head and, and in two other cases, drowning. And still no, to this day, no conviction. No conviction. And they won't allow a lot of this evidence. First, they said it was lost. Uh, Just a few years ago, they did find this evidence. And now they wanted to try and do more DNA, more current DNA testing on it. And they're just being blocked at every turn. I think the state is afraid of multi-million dollar lawsuits. You know what's sad? They're going to wait until all of the people who made all of the mistakes are dead. And then they'll admit to it. And then they'll clear it up. Probably. There's a couple things that people who say that the West West Memphis Three are guilty are going to bring up. And those things are some fibers that were found that supposedly matched a rug and a bathrobe in that were found on the, the deceased boys that supposedly matched the West Memphis Three. Those fibers were found to be so common they could be in anybody's house and matched fibers from the deceased boys' houses as well as from anybody in town. But it sounds comments. like these three guys didn't even know each other. Two of them did. Damien Eccles and Jason Baldwin were best friends. Jesse and Miss Kelly was just someone they were acquainted with. Like, what, you're just going to go pick up a stranger to commit a murder? Like, who does that? Right, right. And again, every, a lot of the things that Jesse and Miss Kelly said happened in his confession, because they will say that he confessed multiple times, and he did, and you can find his multiple confessions online. None of them match. He says in these confessions that they tied the boys up with brown rope. It was shoelaces. He said that the boys were sexually assaulted. None of them were sexually assaulted. Uh, he said that they were they're strangled with a stick. None of them were strangled. So many things that he said in his multiple confessions were just found to not be true. And okay, he confessed multiple times. 
they don't match. They're not right. They're consistent with someone who needs help. He, and even in one of the confessions, he's not trying to confess. He says he wants psychological help and he's trying to get help. And that's why he's saying these things. So the confession just doesn't add up. I am glad to see that they were able to have some, get some sort of life back because these three guys were screwed and 18 years is a long time to get stolen from you. And the U.S. government stole that 18 years from these kids. There are some people that think they're guilty. And some of the things they'll bring up are Jesse Miss Kelly's confessions. And those are just, they're too inconsistent. They're too, it, it's just been proven how easy it is to lead someone to false memories and false confession. And I just can't, I don't care that he's done it multiple times. That's consistent with someone who was seriously messed with. They convinced him that he robbed a bank. Correct. The other thing they'll bring up again are the fibers. And and again, those fibers just aren't consistent enough to be proof of anything. Um, they also talk about blue wax. They'll talk about blue wax, a waxy blue substance that was found on the clothing of one of the boys. And they'll say that a book Damien had, had a blue waxy substance on it. And Damien's girlfriend at the time had a blue candle. I'm sorry. That's not admissible enough. <laughs> no, none of it was ever proven to be from the same candle. That's that's a stretch. Big stretch. Wow. Wow. And there's some crazy theories out there, too. One of the most prevalent I saw was that proof positive that the West Memphis Three are guilty is that in Jesse's confession, he mentions that they urinate in the mouths of the boys and that two of the boys were found with urine in their mouths and in their stomachs. That's not true. There was no urine. I, I've read the autopsy reports. There was no urine found in any of the boys' mouths if or stomachs. If they were underwater, how are they finding urine in their mouth when they're found underwater? So if they had if they had ingested urine, it would be in their throat or in their stomach, and they didn't find it anywhere in there. They did find um, creek water in their lungs and in their esophagus. Obviously, and, and in yeah. some cases that was described as brownish yellow. So maybe that's why they're thinking it was urine, but no evidence that's of urine. That's color creek water, folks. <laughs> yeah, and I have seen uh, that as one of the big pieces of evidence that people will cite saying why they think the West Memphis Three are guilty is this urine theory, and that's just not true. This is, what a witch hunt. That's horrible. Literally, it was literally a witch hunt. Literally, it was a Baptist town that went crazy with satanic panic. Like I said, the second scariest thing that happened here, obviously the unsolved murders of these boys is horrible. And the, but the railroading and the literal witch hunt of Damien Eccles, Jesse Miss Kelly and Jason Baldwin is ridiculous. And they need justice. The three little boys, sometimes I've heard them referred to as the forgotten West Memphis three, Chris Byers, Michael Moore and Stephen Branch. Those poor boys, they deserved so much better than this fucking horrible police case. I mean, oh my goodness. Just and so doesn't their parents. Absolutely. Absolutely. They deserved so much better. It's so scary. So that's my story today, y'all. <laughs> Jeez Louise. That's that's a take a big hit after that one story. I feel very bad for the families of the three boys. Um that, all that of them, lost. all six boys, the families of all six boys. But I am grateful that the other three boys were able, albeit way too late, to get some semblance of life back. I agree. I agree. Luckily, the one the one boy uh, was able to get out of this before he was executed. But the reality is, is he could have been executed innocently and no one would have given a shit as far as the government. The government, the state of Arkansas wouldn't have given a fuck if they accidentally executed this guy. They'd be like, eh, our bad, sorry. They would have happily executed him. They wanted to execute him. Yeah, so luckily he was able to, to persevere and make it to the other side. Jason Baldwin, um, who was Damien Eccles' best friend at the time this happened, and I believe they are still friends. When you watch the video of these men giving the Alford plea, Damien recognizes that Jason didn't want to do it because they had to say they were guilty. And Jason didn't want to do that. However, Jason did it knowing that the state was trying to kill his friend. They were literally going to kill Damien and the only way to get him off death row is to say you did it. 
was to do this Alfred plea and say, I'm innocent, but I'm going to say I'm guilty so that you can charge me with time served and let us all go and save my friend. And, and they hug, you know, Damien recognizes the sacrifice that Jason made by doing that. And it, it's the fact that they can still be positive and make a difference and move forward after 18 years of their life was stolen. And that's what happens when you're witches, bitches. You learn how to rise And that's above. why it scared me. I was a new <laughs> witch at the time and I'm out and proud and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to let my witch flag fly. But it legitimately has danger for some people. And it still does today. Yeah. But you know what? It was that it was that that background and that faith that that got them through in, in the same respect. Exactly. Exactly. Like the book he wrote that, you know, his his spiritual adventures essentially yeah. while on death row. It became a big thing. And and as a as a young witch, to me, it was vitally important to see how this turned out. And and now, decades later, you know, to see it it come to them with the Alfred plea in 2011 and and now still trying to make their way. And and even like I said, in February, they're still trying to clear their names and find the real killer. I don't know. I don't know if you're going to top this uh, West Coast story today, Shell, because this know. one is an ongoing tragedy. I I almost give up without starting, but I do have I do have a good one. It is oh, a yay. good one. I don't know if it's going to trump your your West Memphis three, but it is a good one. I I want to talk a little bit real quick, and this isn't as long. Connecticut Hill Cemetery which is a part of uh, the Alpine portal. I, I think I, rem- I do remember the cemetery, but what's an Alpine portal? Now, I don't think in at the time, this was a while ago, so you may not remember all of the details, but about what year is it? 2022, six, seven, eight, like eight years ago, I made you go here. We've been here. Maybe I do remember. Isn't that the cemetery where like the phone stopped working? I, I don't remember it being called a portal though. I might have better described it and some shit went down and you might not remember the other parts of it. But remember that which cemetery we went to? Yes, I do. Everything stopped working and we were panicked. Yes, I do remember that. All all electronic things suddenly stopped working. Batteries died. Things started acting wonky. Alpine portal. Okay. So uh, for, for our listeners out there, this is um, the Alpine, Cor- uh, Alpine portal is located on Connecticut Hill in Alpine, New York, which is give or take roughly roundabout kind of near the Corning Elmira area. Imagine one Saturday afternoon, Shell calls you and says, oh my God, I found this place and we have to go tonight. Bring your weed. Always a good time. I highly recommend if you're lucky enough to have that happen, do it, do it, go. Do it, right? I am like that friend. You I always are. have these weird adventures. So I had found this. I, I think I had come across it online. I think you can find it on a, on a website called Road Trippers supposedly. Now this is about an hour or so uh, away from, from my hometown, but supposedly this Alpine portal, they deem it as you can meet aliens, Bigfoot, and your dead grandmother in one spot. (laughs) Um, Wow. That sounds like a party right there. (laughs) It does. It does. So there's a couple things going on in this location. Now, when, when you and I went with a few friends, we kind of, we kind of honed in specifically on a very, wooded out of most kind of flow of people area this the cemetery that supposedly had a witch buried in it which we'll get to that in a minute so off we go to the cemetery we didn't really focus on the alien bigfoot piece of it we were kind of more into the cemetery piece yeah we were looking for the witch's grave we were more looking for absolutely. that absolutely you know if bigfoot happened to hop along we were down but we were we down weren't, totally. we weren't particularly looking for him at that time Right. We were more looking for the, for the, the witch cemetery. Right. And we were like, Hey, you know, <laughs> if, if any uh, green men come along in a spaceship, we're down. Right. If you get abducted, take me along. We'll take a ride with you around the sun. This is um, in, in the, the hills of lower New York state. It's on uh, what's called state game lands. And this place, these lands have been whispered about by locals for decades and decades and decades. Reportedly, it's the home to a migratory pod of Sasquatch. 
oh. which for, for any of our Bigfoot listeners out there, because I know we have some, um, if you know anything about this, hit us up because I want more details about the old Bigfoot in New York State thing. But what's a group of Sasquatch? Like, is it a pod? You know, like it's a murder of crows or whatever, like. I don't know. They just call it a migratory pod a of migratory Sasquatch. Pod. Okay. So like a herd of Sasquatch, a pod? I guess. I don't know. Okay. But Connecticut Hill has also been the home uh, of UFO sightings, wandering ghosts, and other strange phenomena that have lent credence to the land's nickname, the Alpine Portal. This actually also used to be uh, a Native American settlement on this hill. There's some different reasons why people think that it was abandoned. But some people say that the, that the Native Americans left Connecticut Hill because they were driven out of the area by George Washington's troops in the 1700s. Possible. And then they say that more recently, people abandoned it because the climate made for terrible farming. And there are people to this day that say that they did have family uh that had lived in that area and on that hill uh, more recently even than that. But now, present day, it is a part of the game lands, uh, the state wildlife management area. So it's it's basically like New York State wooded area. Even a, not, not just the local people, even paranormal investigators have been, who have been there say the wildlife on Connecticut Hill is a little wilder than usual. Really? Okay. Like how so? Well, they believe like like to go to circle to the Bigfoot thing again, um, they believe that this migratory pod of Sasquatch happened to stop in this area for shelter during the winter months before moving further south for the winter. Think of it as like a rest stop on their highway to warmer places. I don't know. So they're snowbirding to Florida and they happen to stop here. Apparently. Okay. I didn't know Sasquatch is snowbirded in a pod. I actually thought that they kind of were like singular Rome alone people, but you know, I guess you have to, I am not a Bigfoot expert, so I don't know. <laughs> I guess you have to hook up and get some booty to recreate at some point. Right. Right. So <laughs> yeah, maybe it's a parent. Maybe they, I don't know. Maybe they stay together with the kids. Maybe it's a family unit. I just can't believe I just mentioned Sasquatch getting booty, but you know, hey, Sasquatch whatever. sex. That's not what this podcast is about. <laughs> it is not. It is not. We promise. Um, but they've actually backed up their claims with what they call convincing photos, videos, plaster casts of footprints taken from the hill, as well as uh, purported Sasquatch vocalizations. Now, for people who are sitting there thinking, you know, Bigfoot is on the West Coast, my friend. They've look. recorded Bigfoot talking. That's what they say. Vocalizations, wow. not talking. Vocalizations. Sounds. Bigfoot sounds yeah. like. Yeah. Like. <laughs> <laughs> Is that like an actual Bigfoot sex sound? Because Bigfoot getting so. booty right there. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> so. Okay. But I remember when I was younger, and like I said, you know, it's about an hour away from my hometown. Uh, there were Bigfoot sightings. So. For all, all you people who think that, that Bigfoot hasn't taken a visit on the East Coast, I assure you, friends, he has. Yeah, there's a rest stop on his way to Florida right there. Right. Like, this isn't out of the realm of possibility as far as I'm concerned. So they, you know, eyewitness accounts of quick glimpses of the creature, uh, violent campsite attacks in the dead of night. But my own personal add in, I want to say this is black bear country, people. Right. I, I'm not saying no Sasquatch. I'm just saying there's black bears that want your food. <laughs> They have seen uh, reports of big blurry beasts. The area is rife with UFO sightings, EMF field disturbances. And, and this is where our personal experience comes into play. People have recorded EMF field disturbances high enough to shut down vehicles and make things such as phones, cameras, lighting equipment unusable, uh, all of which you and I had experienced. Yes, we did. Flashlights, phones, radios, cameras, everything. I remember that was the one time I panicked because I'm like, I know my phone was at 100% and it's not turning on. Right? Like, it didn't dawn on me. I'm like, why is my phone not turning on? It was 100%. What's going on? And I'm like, oh, shit. There's and then we were all like, why aren't our phones turning on? Why are the batteries dead in my camera? Yeah. 
And then we got scared because the car wouldn't start and we smoked a lot of weed. <laughs> and I remember like we, the pipe went around two or three times around our circle of friends. And then our friend that was driving his van started it up and we were like, let's get the hell out we of We are here. so gone. I was so happy when that van finally started up. I was so sure that battery was never going to start. You know, Scary. I thought we were going to. I, I, that was after Blair Witch had come out, like years after. But it, you know, I had the Blair Witch in my mind, and I'm like, we're gonna die in these fucking woods today, man. <laughs> I think we I always die. had the Blair Witch in my mind when I went in the woods back in that time. <laughs> you know, I just one thing that stands out to me to kind of tie this to our 420 episode is I remember when nothing was working and we were all kind of panicking. I, I specifically remember turning to your husband and saying. Does at least your lighter work? <laughs> and he flicked yes. his lighter. And that's when we were like, well, at least we can smoke. You know, we can't leave. We can't get our phones to work, but we can get high. That was our priority. We're like, well, if we can get high, we might as well die here. It's one of the things we love about my husband. No matter what's going on, you can always count on him to have a working lighter and a packed bowl. Always. For real. Yep. And, and you know, I, the aliens could have come at that point because we had a packed bowl. Yeah, right. We we were fine. We're like, all right, we're smoking. We're okay. And then, of course, the car started and we were good to go. Right. But there is actually, you can find online a documentary where they have captured actual evidence of Sasquatch. So that is definitely an interesting thing if you want to check that out. We went up there, you know, like I said, with the intention of going to the cemetery and I didn't have any UFO experiences. I wish I did, really. I'm not lying. I really wish that we would have seen the Me too. ship. I wanted to see something. I would have loved to see a UFO, a Bigfoot, anything. We'll have to go back. But, you know, I, I have pictures because if you recall, we kind of went there. We got there right before dusk. So when we were initially there, it was still light out right. and while we were kind of traversing this abandoned cemetery in the woods, it was getting progressively darker until it was dark. Pitch black. I actually still have pictures of when the phone still worked and it was daylight time because um, things didn't start dying on us until it was like that darkish time. That's fantastic. I remember my pictures of that time. A lot of them didn't come out. Uh, I had a couple pictures, like you said, when it was starting to get dusk. And everything was still working. And then any pictures I took after that, up until my they're camera gone. and my phone died, they're gone. So I'm glad you have some pictures. I had been looking back. I mean, I, I probably was only able to salvage like maybe six pictures. Looking back at some of those, if you kind of look at the scenery around it, you see some of those thin little branches bend over like how the Sasquatch trackers say that they bend over the branches. Like I see some, I see some of that in the backgrounds of these pictures. Another thing I distinctly remember that freaked me the hell out. We got to a point where the path kind of went into a circle around a circular formation of, of tombstones. I remember and it was that. Like, the couple that we get came with, it. they got lost on that circle. We I don't know if get they out were of that super high. Or, we couldn't somehow. They got lost and then we all got lost. It's like, wait a minute. There was so many paths into this circle. How are we just on a circle with no paths out now? It was so weird. And that was the thing. It was almost like there was a time bend at this cemetery. That's a good way to put it. Like a time bend. Because you and I and the people we were with, we are naturally woodsy people. We are not the type of people who are going to walk 50 yards into the woods and not be able to get out. Because essentially, looking back, we were really only about 50 yards off the road, but yet we couldn't find the road. And we had been following very clearly marked paths on the ground. You could see the dirt paths where countless people had walked before you. And somehow in trying to find the people that were with us, we got onto this circular path that had multiple paths leading to it. And then all of a sudden it's like, it's just a circular path. And we kept running into each other, but not finding the way out. It was very it was strange. Definitely like one of those weird time bend locations. Yeah. I attributed it to the really excellent weed we were smoking, but it was definitely a strange vortexy woods for sure. And I, I also remember, you know, there, there being like, not voices, but like, all I can explain it as dead people talking. I don't know a better description. There were multiple people that thought they heard people whispering or talking to them. Yeah, there was a lot of that going on. 
I remember one of our friends, the the one that actually drove us out there. I remember him saying he kept hearing a woman crying mm-hmm. and there was no, no one around. Wasn't he was trying to follow that sound when he and his girlfriend got lost on that path. And then we were trying to find them. So weird. But, you know, in retrospect, I think that we were at one of those locations that is not right. For sure. I mean, with all the electronic equipment that just failed and acted wonky, it was very obvious something was not right. Right down to the car not starting when we got there or when we got back to it originally. And if you want to experience one of those weird vortexy places, by all means, go there because it is. It's strange. Like I had read some, um, some people had posted some personal experiences online that people have been there. Um, there's been paranormal investigators that have gone there. And Ooh, such. tell me what's happened. Someone just, des- someone described it as a sanctuary of strange activity. That's a if good that description. Is not right up our alley. Yeah. And I would say that describes our experiences there for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like I said, I would have been super stoked if like the mothership came down and asked us if we wanted to take a ride, but you know, no such alien encounter, but there's definitely something not right at that location. There was because... definitely enough weirdness that even I, even I remember distinctly that it, it was definitely odd. There, there was enough crazy stuff that I don't, I can't explain. And it was strange, the whole area. And, you know, kind of back to the, the time bend thing, it felt like we were there for like a half hour when in reality we were there for like hours. I was just going to mention that. We were like, how the hell have we been here this long? It got dark and we all remarked on how quickly it had gotten dark. And then once we found our friends and we're like, you know what, let's get out of here and get back to the car. I think the longest time someone said, you know, it's been like 40, it's only been 45 minutes and, and we get to the car and it had been like three hours or something. And none of us felt like it had been anywhere close to an hour. Yeah, no, there's there's definitely some funk on Connecticut Hill and, and it's there's definitely some odd time bend there, which then makes me a little more believable to the migratory pod and, and you sure. know, and, and the mother craft coming. There has actually been a lot of UFO activity in that part of New York State. And it's not just in articles and, and research you'll find about Connecticut Hill alone. If you just do some some general UFO research. Um, you'll actually find stuff that points back to the area of Connecticut Hill. So not as crazy as people think. You and I just happened to not experience any extraterrestrial activity when we were there. I would say the things that we did experience were pretty wild. So people actually see lights and craft around that area? They do. They see lights. They see crafts. Um, There was actually a a burn mark from what a, a resident claim to be a ship. They were able to confirm that burn mark. There was residue um, in the field that they basically would not admit to what that residue was. Oh, damn. So there, there, there has been not just enough, sightings, like possible landings. There's been enough documented in that area that you can see where the cover ups begin. Wow. That's, that's surprising. Like you hear a lot about people seeing lights in the sky and unexplained sightings there, but you don't too often hear like an actual landing site where there's burn marks and unexplained chemicals in the field. That's why that is, you know, you also got to remember though, that part of New York state, super, super flat and farmy. Right. It's very rural. Yeah. So, you know, there is a lot of space and not as many people, you know, if you're, an alien looking for a parking spot, right? The bright lights of New York city are going to attract you. And then you're like, Hey, there's a big dark spot where I can go park. It's perfect. Right. 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 But I don't, I don't know, you know, I haven't been able to find anything that kind of talks back to what the cause of this Alpine portal could be. I also found, you know, there's, not a lot of ley lines in upstate New York, but there are some. And there is one, I think it was like 45 miles from Connecticut Hill. I don't know if that's close enough to have. Like I don't a ley know line enough effect. about ley lines. Maybe. I don't either. So I don't know if that's close enough to it to have it that have any sort of metaphysical effect, but some's awry up there. And I think we should go back again sometime. But this time, I think we should be looking to be like, 
abducted to another world. Right. We should go specifically looking for some cryptids and uh, see if we can find a Bigfoot and some aliens and not just a All witchy right, you grave. You know the ghosts are there. So check ghosts. Yeah. Now we need time, to- weird time thing. Check. Now we need to check mark off Bigfoot and the aliens. aliens. I agree. I agree. Well, I, I, it, it, it is a beautiful place in the daytime, but be prepared to a have to find your bearings and b be a little spooked if you go up to Connecticut Hill. Yeah, make but sure we had to bring blast. some bring some analog equipment too. You know, bring a regular wristwatch and not an electronic one. Let us know if your electronics also crap out on you when you get there, and and if you have any time anomalies because we certainly did. But on the bright side, again, even everything stopped working, including our vehicle. But the one thing that kept us through and never died on us, that Bic lighter. A Bic lighter. Yeah. My <laughs> lovely husband <laughs> saves the day yet again. The Superman he, he of the weed world. The we were, I, I mean, I was panicking. I don't know how you were feeling at that moment, but I'm like, the fucking car is not starting. And this is not normal. <laughs> Where's your lighter? Does it work? We need to be more high. We're not high enough for this shit. Yeah. <laughs> and we had a lot of those moments. <laughs> the one thing that I was sad about is, is we did actually find that witch grave and in the tombstone said something to effect that that person was a witch. So we did find the witch grave that we were looking for. Two things. One, I was sad that it was broken half, and, but it was memorialized by passersby beautifully. But the minute we got to that witch grave is where my pictures stopped coming up. I didn't get pictures of the grave. They never turned out. And every picture after that did not turn out. So it's almost like as far as my photographs go, I was good to go up until we found the witch grave. And then everything was fucked after that. Yep. That's about where mine crapped out too. It was the pathway leading up there is where the pictures started going wonky. And it was before I got there that everything died. I do remember seeing the gravestone and all the, the incense and the coins and the, and the, the stones, the crystals, the flowers, people that had left there was, was great. I loved seeing that. And you could feel the energy shift there a little bit but that's also where shit got real too. that's also where shit got real and and it seemed like that was the one everything was weird there but that was the one place where it felt um it felt serene and charged i guess it was it was very weird and very energetic but ultimately it wasn't spooky because that's what we were going for we were going right. For that right there, all the other stuff freaked us the hell out. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That I used the description charged and you said energized. And, and I think we all kind of felt that, that, that place for whatever reason, whether it was the intent of all the people going there and all the things they put there, whether it was the witch herself. Um, I, I don't know whether it was the ley line that's 45 miles away or something else there that drew all these different things, but you could definitely feel it when you were at that point. That was like the focal point. I don't know, but between the witch and Bigfoot, someone was fucking with us when we were on that circular path. I don't know who was making the sounds in the woods, whether that was a Sasquatch pod or, you know, people fucking with us. But there was definitely sounds of people in the woods. And again, you and I are not unfamiliar with the sounds that the woods in, in on the East Coast can make. We know the different night sounds and birds and creatures. And then these weren't those. no. These weren't our normal woodsy noises. Definitely creepy. These were the kind of noises that make you look over your shoulder and look behind you and kind of scope your surroundings kind of noises. One of those uh, unusual places. You know, everybody says it's beautiful. Everybody says it's 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 a very serene place. Mm -hmm. But it is also um, one person described it as mysterious, mysterious, mysteriously intoxicating i don't know our intoxication was coming from all the weed we were smoking so i can't yeah, differentiate that definitely two. helped but i think i think that the one person that described it is a sanctuary of strange activity i could totally back that that billing of this place agreed many people have you know we had talked about our our, our friend hearing someone crying there are other reports of people hearing a sobbing woman um, among the gravestones and people say that they when they would walk towards where they seemed uh, to think it was coming from, 
all of a sudden it would sound like it was coming from behind them again. No matter how many times they tried to approach the sound of a crying woman, it always kept sounding like it was behind them. Other people were not the only ones. Other people um, have reported that their cars uh, would not start up, that their instrument panels were going haywire. So again, that's something other people besides us have experienced. There have been some um, Bigfoot, Sasquatch, quote unquote, hunters that have reported that they have been able to communicate with the uh, well-known knocking signaling that Sasquatch use. And not only have they been able to get the Sasquatches to communicate back, but they've been actually able to have them go on for over an hour of back and forth knocking. Wow. So there are not only vocalizations here, but also the, the knocking communication that they're known to do. Yeah. Wow. And, you know, I, you're also going to find, and I did find some of this in my research too. You're going to find people who are like, oh, I'm from the area. This is a bunch of bullshit. None of this stuff ever happens. This is all a bunch of poppycock. Y'all are crazy. Sure. Well, everyone always, there's know. lots of that everywhere. There's lots of that everywhere. And all I can tell you is I've been there. I've done that. And I was a little spooked. I was a little spooked. I'm not going to lie. You had me when the car wouldn't start. You had me when all of us were having trouble with our our electronics. Every single one of us, our electronics stopped working in one way or another. And that's when I, that was weird. That doesn't usually happen. And, 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 you know, we were kind of with a group of people that are, pretty technically knowledgeable. I mean, <laughs> yeah. We might as well had the genius crew with us. I mean, and right. we were struggling and it, it 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 was it was the real deal. Um mm-hmm. loved it. I'd totally go back again, but Connecticut Hill and Alpine New York, real deal, folks. Yeah, go if you want to experience some anomalies and maybe see some aliens or Bigfoot. How fun is so, that? Your story is is definitely Oh, that was scary for so many different reasons. I mean, the but ours was a fun, badass road trip that I was just like, hey, I got this idea, guys. It was a spectacular good time. That's for sure. And thankfully, you you guys always just are like, all right, where's she taking us now? Your ideas, your road trips are always fun. I would never miss one. (laughs) Anytime you're like, I have an idea. I am there. You know that girl. I'm right there. Right there. I, I think I think sometime we should we should um, revisit Connecticut Hill because definitely an active place that I, I agree. think you will definitely on some level experience something. Mm-hmm. Also, in honor of our 420 show here, um, I have a couple shout outs I'd like to do. Who are you shouting out today? <laughs> one of them actually doesn't have anything to do with 420. This one is Chris Griffiths, who is the host of a podcast called They're Not Shadows. And I highly recommend you listen to episode 41 of this podcast because on it, do you remember in our episode, the one with Tom and we all told yeah. personal ghost stories? I wrote out my personal ghost story and shared it with some people. And Chris Griffiths asked if he could read it on his podcast. He does great stuff. First of all, his voice is dreamy. It's perfect for telling ghost stories. And he uses sound effects and background music. So if you want to hear my story told the way it really should be told, check out the podcast, They're Not Shadows, episode 41. My story is The Staircase. Awesome. I can't wait. I'll have to check it out. You should. It's super creepy. It's fantastic. I love how he does it. I also want to shout out someone I hope to have on as an interview this month. Um, Her name is Lisa Ann, and she is the host of Empower with Flowers. She has a YouTube channel, and I love her so much. She is so positive. She's so into weed. She's into witchcraft, and she just has the coolest little videos. She does educational videos. She talks about THC, THCV, how to roll joints. She talks about weed delivery. She's all about empowering women with cannabis. And I'm totally into that. And I just love her and her channel's adorable. Empower with Flower on YouTube. If she can teach me how to roll a joint after all of these years then I will deem her the expert. Awesome. We should have her on and we'll do a little interview with her. We'll see if she can teach the rolling deficient shell how to roll a joint. I am deficient (laughs) in rolling. 
She is amazing. I love all her weed. She has like stashes and stashes of it. I think I have a lot of pot and she's got like rolls of joints everywhere. I love this woman. She's fantastic. Oh my goodness. This has been a very spooky 420 episode. I am absolutely stoned on my Fuchi Que Pesta. And again, thank you to uh, Happy Valley for your mix and match. Eight eighths for 288. Uh, We love 420 deals. Thank you, everyone, for your deals. So thank you all for listening to the Stoned Witches Hour. I hope you've enjoyed our stories today. If you want any more information, check out the show notes. I'll have a couple links for you on information about the West Memphis Three and the case about the Forgotten Boys. What are we doing next week, Shell? smoking weed talking. oh yeah lots of weed <laughs> weed and talking my favorite things i'm so weed down and talking it'll be a surprise how about we not tell them and they have to they have to wait with bated breath Ooh, okay. anticipation that sounds and that great an, that anticipation will get them through the week and then they can finally hear our last episode of april And if you have any ideas of either of weed you want us to smoke, munchies you'd like us to try, or stories you think we should look into, email us at thestonedwitcheshour at gmail.com or send us a DM on our Instagram, stonedwitcheshour. So I hope you all have an excellent 420 and uh, stay stony. Puff, puff, pass. Sweet. Oh, and Dave's not here, man. (laughs) Let me in. No, I'm Dave. Let me in, man. It's not here. <laughs> Who? No, well, I'm Dave. Anyway, <laughs> love you, Cheech and Chong. OGs <laughs> of the stoner world. <laughs> so I think that's good. I feel bad for those guys. Who, Cheech and Chong? Or the- no, the West Memphis Three. Holy shit, yeah. The, I mean, 18 years, dang. That's, that's a lot of your life to have stolen. And then to get no reparations because the state is scared. There's like, eh, good luck. <laughs>